Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this workshop of our 10th conference. We, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary and have uh, been given a task to run a workshop on the title of uh, You Must Marry. It's uh, dealing with the issue of marriage and why we must marry. It's a command, you must marry. So from the subject at hand, one can immediately tell that uh, the world is facing a problem today in this area of marriage. And truly so. Marriage should never be seen as an optional matter that one can choose to undertake or not. More so, as I speak to Christians, we must have uh, a view that uh, marriage can never be an optional matter that you choose to undertake or not. In my talk with uh, young adults in our church, recently it revealed to me how much social media today dictate uh, people's views on uh, this matter of marriage. The minds of young people have been given strange ideas uh, about marriage. The world currently looks at marriage as an institution that should never be drawn closer to. Or rather, they look at marriage as an optional matter in which one can decide out of his own way, his own volition or her own volition, to avoid so that marriage therefore becomes, uh, like I've said, an optional matter that you don't enter into. So statements like, I don't want anybody in my space, it's very common today. Statements like, I can live sufficiently without a man or a woman in my life are common statements that we hear today. Or things like, uh, marriage is a headache. I don't want headache, so I will not marry. Others opt for single parenting, and uh, it's been taken as a cool thing to be a single parent. It's a way of, again, avoiding marriage, that I can just have a child or children without being engaged in a marriage contract. As Christians, we must always seek to have our worldview and conscience bound to the scripture and not to do otherwise despite what is popular in the world. And so the statements of Martin Luther is very helpful to us here, that our conscience, even in issues of marriage, should be bound to the Bible and not what the world says. So we must Always ask, as Christians, again, what does the Bible say in this matter of marriage? And not, what does the world say? In other words, we must constantly ask, what is the will of God in this matter? And that is going to be my task in this workshop, therefore, to ask what is the will of God in as far as marriage is concerned, and find an answer to that. Once we establish his will, then it becomes rather mandatory that we follow the will of God. Hence the title of our subject today. Let me explain a bit about the will of God. Theologically, we divide the will of God basically into two. The ones that he has decreed, the things that he has decreed, called decretive will and prescriptive will, or sometimes called hidden will and revealed will. When it comes to decretive will, there's nothing we can do about it. God has decreed that what he has said, what he has commanded, will come to happen. And man, whatever he does, cannot change that. 
Some matters are very clear in the Bible, and men just choose to ignore them, replacing them with their own will and desire. So when I say that you must marry, I am not just taking a position of some old man in the village who is urging his son or daughter to get a partner soon. But we are looking at what is called prescriptive will of God. This is where man ordinarily do choose to do his own things and not according to what God has commanded us to do. So let's look then at uh, the prescriptive will of God in as far as this institution is concerned. So in the next uh, minutes and um, 30 minutes or so, we are going to search the will of God in this matter. What is his will for man? What is his will for mankind, man and woman, in as far as uh, marriage is concerned? Let's begin by searching the scriptures, therefore. First, we turn to the book of uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, as we look at uh, the will of God from scripture. Don't forget, our conscience is bound to the scriptures, and it is in the scriptures that we find the will of God as he has revealed them to us, as he has prescribed his will to us. So let me read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 1 to 4, so that we can see something there concerning the will of God. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the, ins through the insincerity, ins ins sorry, through the insincerity of liars who Consci whose conscience are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. There are so many reasons why people say that they will not marry, including religious reasons. Some people use religion to forbid others from marrying. Apostle Paul lumps all such reasons as teachings of the devil and his demons. The work of Satan is always to oppose God he takes the opposite view of the will of God more often and always. He takes the opposite view. Hence, here we can easily deduce that God's will is that mankind must marry. Satan uses his people to tell man that he should not marry, even disguising himself in religion, so that the will of God is not met in this. Unless these people are students of the devil and his demons, they will choose not to marry and forbid others by coercion or sweet talk. I mean, if they are students of Satan, and Satan therefore is their teacher in this matter of marriage, the devil and the demons that work with him will convince such people that marriage is not right. And as I've said, sometimes he comes even as an angel of light in religion to tell people not to marry against the will of God, as we've seen in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Number two, when Adam was created, two things were lacking in his home. One was companionship, and two, the ability to do one of God's will, which comes and should only come through marriage. That is the ability to procreate. Procreation is the sexual activity of conceiving and bearing offspring. 
So God created Adam and Eve, but before Eve came into the scene, Adam was created, and there are two things that were expected of him, which he was actually lacking, a good companion and even ability to procreate, to reproduce after his own kind. So we can see that neither Adam nor Eve was created as hermaphrodite. In both cases, the ability of man to have a companion, to make him complete, to the point that God wanted him to be complete, and the ability to bear children would only be realized in close union with an opposite sex and in marriage. We see that from the book of uh, Genesis, if we can turn to Genesis chapter 2, we see what I'm trying to say here, and it's clearly displaying to us the will of God in this. Let me just read that for you, Luke chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Then you jump to verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now if you go back to chapter 1, you read with me verse 26, chapter 1 verse 26, and 20, all the way to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on earth. Clearly, that shows us that God wants us to marry for the sake of companionship and ability to procreate, reproduce after our own kind, and even subdue the earth. Now, that's number two. Number one, we saw what Paul tells Timothy, that it is satanic teachings, demonic, to teach that man shall not marry. And number two, we are seeing the will of God in that man needs a companion, and man needs an opposite sex for procreation, and this can only be found in a woman and in the institution of marriage. You don't procreate outside marriage according to God. Number three, we can get our third point right from the book of Genesis, chapter one that we just read. We'll find another reason why we must marry. Generally, man is uh, very fearful of, uh, say, wild animals. 
if today I told you that come and visit me in my house, but I then hasten to add that anyway in my house, even though you are coming, there are two cobra snakes that are as care to me there. Or even say that, uh, you know, there's a lion that just came to my house, refused to go, and uh, though you are going to visit me, just be alerted that there's a fierce lion there, or a cheetah. I want you to imagine a situation where a huge population of the world decides that they're not going to marry, they're going to disobey God in this. Give it even 50% of the population that they're not going to marry. And you know, the moment the population says that, it means that the image of God is going to be reduced in this world. Because you and I bear that image. The image of God will be reduced from the earth by not producing after mankind. We are going to be subdued by the animals of the earth. There's no way that we can then now complete this mandate that God has given us that we, we produce after mankind and fill the earth and subdue the animals. In fact, each time a man or a woman decides that uh, he or she is not going to marry, hence, therefore, we assume not going to produce children, we are giving the animals an upper population on earth. Let's take an hypothesis that uh, each time that uh, this great population decides that they are not going to marry, therefore not reproduce, let's take an hypothesis that uh, the number of, say, even snakes to man, the ratio can be even five to one. Or let's say lion to man, five to one. Or leopard to man, five to one. Now, that is a dangerous situation. If the Lord chooses not to come for the next hundred years with that kind of an attitude that men are not producing, the tragedy will be that the image of God in man will be almost no more and soon subdued by these animals we saw fear. Now, this is not far-fetched. Just go to an abandoned village today and see what I mean. See the tragedy of no man in that village. No woman in that village. No children in that village. And see the number of wild animals roaming freely in that small village. Or in a home where there are no people. It is basically subdued by wild animals. Now, that mandate for us to conquer the world, subdue the world, is compromised by people saying that they will not marry. Hence, going against the will of God that man should reproduce after his own kind and populate the earth and subdue the earth. It's going against that will of God. We must marry and procreate in order to avoid this tragedy on earth. Number four, why we must marry, biblically. As we come to our fourth point, why we must marry, again, it is because it is the will of God and naturally, this will flow from points number two and three that I've mentioned. We have to marry because it is in that institution that we fulfill our sexual desires in the right place. In other words, if we have to procreate, there must be sex and there must be desire for it. So my number four point is that God wants us to marry because that is the institution where sexual desire is met in the right way. You can't procreate if the desire of the opposite sex is not there. 
at all. God, therefore, could not have given Adam and Eve the mandate to fill the earth and yet deny them the ability to feel attracted sexually to each other. It will be like sending soldiers to war without arms. And we are not wild animals in the jungle. God made the rightful institution for us to fulfill our sexual desires, which is there. It is not pornography. It's not in pornography that as many men has been misled and women, young people and old, that they, that's an institution where they can fulfill their sexual desires. It is against God's plan that is sin. It is a natural way that men have chosen and women have chosen to fulfill their sexual desires. And this is some, these are some of the things that uh, also have bombarded the minds of our young people that they now see no reason why they should marry. However, the Bible says, if you have that desire, get a wife, get a man for yourself. Let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians and see what I'm saying here. Chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own a husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That is basically sex and in the institution of marriage. Verse 7. I wish that all were as myself am, um, but each has his own gift from God, one of one, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, that is sexually, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Then when you go to uh, verse 36, you see the same call. Why should Paul repeat this thing many times? It means it is important. Verse 36, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passion are strong, and it has to be, notice that if his passion are, are, are strong, and it has to be, which means if it is not there, it is abnormal. Let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. So we see here, therefore, that the Bible is very clear that marriage is important. We must marry. By God putting this desire for sex in you, it is clear enough that you can't shun the institution of marriage. If you have this urge, you need a partner, my friend. Do not live in a disobedience to God. A point number five, why we should marry. It is evangelistic. At least marry for the sake of propagating the good news. It is evangelistic. In case you think I've just popped up with that from nowhere. Our agreement was that it should come from the Bible, and I assure you it comes from the Bible. Marriage has its evangelistic mandate, and so we have to marry according to God's will because there's that evangelistic aspect of it. Let's turn to Malachi chapter 2 verse 13. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping, 
and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, who does he, why does he not? And the answer, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And look, uh, hear this question. And what was one God seeking? What was the one God seeking? And the answer is, he made you two become one because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. There is a problem here in Malachi of people just divorcing and uh, uh, adultery is also there, defeating the purpose of marriage as evangelistic. If you divorce, how is God going to realize a godly home? If you are just uh, ad adulterating out there, how is God going to raise up a godly home? And we have to emphasize this because the Bible is very clear even in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, where we have the, uh, the, 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 the qualifications of an elder, it is very clear that there is a role given to man in the, in the institution of marriage that this role, for us to choose one to be an elder of the church, he must have qualified himself from home in the manner that he raised up his children in godliness. We'll see this uh, in our next workshop. But the point is, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, for one to be made an elder, we are looking at how far has he worked hard to be evangelistic, raising godly home, as the Lord requires in Malachi chapter 2. So even when you read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 to 9, that is still very clear as Moses tells the children of Israel that from your home you shall teach your children these things. You, you will bind them uh, in, in your houses, you, you will post them in your houses, talk to them when you are walking, talk to the children when they are asleep, talk to them and post these things even in your gates. These are mandates that God has given us so that in marriage we can evangelize and raise up a godly family. I know of many local churches with good number of relatives in it. Father, son, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, grandchildren. And you see that this mandate of raising a godly family is seen if we marry and when we marry. Christians who refuse to marry for their own selfish reasons that they do not want anybody in their space should be charged with the crime of depopulating the church of Christ. Think of it. The will of God is that you marry. It is revealed and not hidden. This is not a hidden will. It is a revealed will. You must marry unless God gives you the gift of celibacy or singlehood. So you do not want to live by the doctrines of Satan or demons. You do not want to live without a befitting companion, both man and woman. Your companion cannot be in the pets or animals we keep at home. Your befitting companion is not the football game. You can't procreate with them. You need an opposite sex for this in marriage. His will is that through marriage we populate the earth and subdue it. We have to do that by marrying. We have to marry because of the sexual urge in us. And we have to marry because of the evangelistic call that the Lord wants to raise a godly home from a godly family from our homes. So as I end loved ones, I want to urge you to be persuaded as a Christian. Go and find a partner. Do not let selfishness and false worldview mislead you. If you are married, you have done well. 
in obeying the will of God. Use that institution for the glory of God. Let your partner continually appreciate this, the institution done, this institution done in Christ. A Christian should have a very high view of marriage. It is like the church of Christ where God is displaying his love and glory on earth. Marriage is seen as a small church that God displays his glory. So we must appreciate it and we must live in it according to what God desires. Sex outside marriage, as we've seen, is sin. Making marriage an institution of war is sin. It doesn't portray what God desires out of it. And if anyone is struggling with these things, even pornography for that matter, or even today people have propagated the having a partner in animals, that's sin. And I would just like to urge you to repent, have the right view of the plan of God for man in marriage. And if you are having these wrong views, you need to repent. Turn to God in repentance. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Hang on Christ Jesus, who is able to change your mind on this matter and bring you closer to the one who instituted this glorious union of man and woman. May the Lord bless you as you listen and as you've listened. And may the Lord bless you even as we wait for our second workshop. Looking forward to meeting you again. Thank you very much for watching.